Hey, what up people? Thank you very much for joining. Super, super excited that you guys are here. Today we're going to see how to render. I prepare a very nice set of slides for you guys. So we are going to go through many, many things about how to render. Super excited that we are getting started. Some of the things that we're going to cover today on how to render is different workflows. We're going to see different rendering workflows. Which ones do I recommend for you guys depending on what is your level of skill and depending on what are the results that you guys want to have. I'm going to show you three tips for new artists that are having problems with your digital painting, with your rendering. And these tips are going to be super useful for all of you. I'm also going to show you how to paint skin, my favorite tips. And of course, I am going to show you how um, I made this painting right here. And we're, we're going to go through some of the steps live so that you guys can ask whatever questions you want. And also, so that you can see exactly how to recreate art like these ones. Now, if you want more, I don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of information. If you want more, I have a lot more tips that I wanted to show in here in this presentation for you guys. We have how to paint hair, we have um, how to change the mood of your illustrations and I dif add different lights. Um, we also have how to add these nice special effects like color luminescence in your shadows and things like that. So if you want all of these things, make sure to leave the word more in the recording of this live stream. And I'm going to make sure to, you know, give you guys all of this new information. So again, super excited to be here. Super excited that you guys are here. If you are ready to begin, uh, please leave me a little fire emoji right there in the chat. I really want uh, to, uh, to see you guys uh, being fired up to learn about rendering. And again, if you're watching this on the replay, just type the word more there in the comments so that I know that you guys are watching from the, from the replay, all right? Uh, I hope that you're listening to me correctly and everything is is <laughs> awesome. Okay, I see the messages coming, so that is excellent. All right, all right. So let's get started. What is rendering? This is one, maybe the most important question that I wanted to cover in here. What is rendering? Because a lot of a lot of artists seem to have um, a misconception of what rendering is, and maybe that is why. When I ask you what is your biggest problem with rendering, so many of you told me things like you didn't know which colors to use, you didn't know which which lights to use, how to make transitions soft in your in your illustrations and things like that. So, I want to show you what is my definition of rendering so that you guys know exactly how to do it. Uh, and what we're going to be covering in here. All right, so let's get started with my conception of rendering. For me, rendering is taking your two-dimensional drawings and simply making, making them three-dimensional paintings. Simple as that. But depending on the style that you have and depending on what is the, the finish and how much time do you have for your painting, you are going to have different effects. So for example, here we have a type of render that relies more on line art. You can see if I zoom in in here, we still have the light and shadow, right? We have light right here, we have shadow right here. But if I would remove the line art of this little drawing, we would be left with a very, very bland drawing. On the other hand, if you guys have more time or depending on the style that you prefer, you can do a rendering that is a little bit more polished, a little bit more painting like this one in here, where if I zoom in, you guys can see that it relies not on line art, but only on the light and shadow, the hair and all of these things are defined by shading and not by light. So that is very important. Rendering is making your drawings more three dimensional, but it's depending on your preference, your style, what you want to do, that is what you're going to uh, accomplish or the workflow that you're going to follow to make your art happen. And you can even have things like this one for all the people that have been following my, my art lately. You saw that I was experimenting with different techniques and this is for my halftone brushes that I released recently. You can see how I use halftones to make the shading of my illustration. So this is a little bit more like cell shading, uh, kind of like a combination of the, the game Hades combined with other art styles that I really like. So I want you guys to know that rendering is anything that you do with your drawings to make your illustration more believable. Because at the end of the day, 
this is what we are doing as artists. We are creating an illusion making our artwork more three-dimensional helps to convince our audience that our drawing is more real and therefore we can sell them this fantasy of our artwork. So this is our objective and we are going to talk now exactly how to begin with your uh, rendering. I have here three tips for new artists. Now, these tips are very important for any any artist out there, but are, they are especially important for all of you that are starting with your rendering. If you have um, problems with your colors, if you find yourself taking a lot of time with your rendering, these are three tips that I want you to pay special attention. All right, so let's go and get started with these three tips. So <clears throat> tip number one, draw 3D. This is super, super important. Let me move this in here so you can see it. Draw 3D. So many times I see artists that make a drawing that looks good on the surface, but the artist doesn't understand what is happening on the shape of your drawing. So this is what you need to do. This is what you need to be thinking while you make your drawing. You need to think three-dimensional. You don't have to understand all the planes of the face. You know, here I have this guy that it is super, super important for a lot of artists to have. Let me show it to you. I am sure that many of you have seen this guy, right? This one is from 3D Total. You can see the planes of the face and the planes of the neck. Very, very important for the artist to know the planes of the face. But this is more of an advanced technique. For all of you that are starting out, it is not necessary to learn all of these things. It is simply it is enough for you to understand how to paint basic volumes. So here we have just, you know, a little sphere for the head, a little cone, and that is all that you need to get started with your rendering. So that is tip number one. Tip number two, please, for the love of God, if you are struggling with your values, with your rendering, practice it in values. There is absolutely no reason for you to complicate your life with color if you can practice with values. Believe me, it is much more complex to go into colors, but if you have your values solid, it's gonna make things easier. So make sure to stay in values until you practice your technique, until you're able to convey a 3D form in a 2D surface, all right? And once you have that, remember, super important, just to go to the same first tip, make sure that you understand your basic figures. It is absolutely essential, even if you start with values, that you understand your basic figures. Get yourself a little sphere, a little cone, a little cylinder, and start practicing how to render those figures and make them look three-dimensional, all right? So that is tip number number two. And this, very important, this applies not only for the beginner artist. If you're struggling in any type of render, make sure to do it. Now, three tip number three. Please, use references. How many times have I received the question of like, do you use reference? How do you use references? Any, any artist out there, any professional artist out there will tell you using references is terrible for your art. We don't remember everything. Even if we have drawn, you know, this little 3D figure in here a thousand times, our head doesn't remember all the details. Reality is very, very complex. So when you're painting anything, human figure especially, very, very complex, make sure to use references. They are going to inform your painting and make sure that you make something accurate, make something more realistic, all right? So, in here, this is the study that I did out of this reference, and this is an extra little bonus, so let's call it three and a half bonus uh, um, points for beginner artists. If you are struggling, studying, even studying references, make sure to take some time to just copy the reference, all right? Here is a little bit stylized, because I like to stylize my pictures and you can have a little bit of fun, but you can see how close it is to the original reference. A little bit of play with colors, a little bit of play with the shape of the nose, a bit more angular, little things like that, but it is still the reference. The further away that you guys go from the reference, let me emphasize this, 
the further away that you take your drawing from the original reference, the harder it is going to be for you guys because you have to control a lot of different things. You have to control your values. You have to control your shape design. You have control your eye and brain coordination to make sure that you're copying something. All of this is way too complex. So all of the artists out there that want to start with invention drawing, it is a bit too challenging. It might be discouraging if you have some problems when trying to accomplish it. So what I tell you guys, stay with references, try to make some studies, stylize it a little bit. You don't have to do something super crazy. You just simply enjoy the reference, play with the colors, play with the shape, and you are going to improve much faster than if you try to begin with all the challenges at once, all right? So those are the three and a half bonus, uh, bonus point there for how to begin your rendering uh, journey, all right? Especially for the beginner artist, all right? So the number one question about rendering, I received a ton of questions from you guys, how to color, how to use lights, how to make transitions, why my colors look, look muddy, how to make painterly style, a lot of these things. But at the end of the day, what I think it all comes down to is what workflow should I use? If you are taking too much time with your painting, if you are having problems with muddy colors, with um, slippery painting that just gets out of, of your hands and you cannot control it, usually is because you don't have the right workflow. You're not working with a workflow that you feel confident with and that you can rely on so that you can do it again and again and trust the process. So I'm gonna share in here with you guys some of my favorite workflows so that you can select the one that works for you the best and get used to it. If you are changing all the time from work, one workflow to another, you're going to never feel confident with one single one and therefore you're not gonna get faster and you're gonna continue having problems. So let's go and talk about workflows. Let's start with something that I think that you guys are going to find fun, something unusual. All the workflows from digital art are in some way children of traditional art. You know, we have been doing traditional art for the whole history of humanity and we have just started with digital art in what, like the past 40 years, something like that. So I want to show you how similar it is traditional art from digital art if you make the right workflow. Because I'm not a uh, traditional artist, I want to share one of my favorite artists out there with you guys. And this is called James Gurney. Leave me a thumbs up if you know James Gurney because this guy is an absolutely OG. This guy is a legend. If you don't know James Gurney, go and give it a Google after this live because he is absolutely fantastic. He's an inspiration and, um, and a master, all right? Let's see how James Gurney, these are just some screenshots taken from his process, makes a painting of a dog. Number one, he uses a reference, all right? <laughs> James Gurney, okay? This guy has painted a hundred times more than I have painted, more than many professionals out there. And still, what is the first thing that he does? He gets a reference, all right? So make sure to get a reference. Don't be proud, get yourself a reference. Number two, thing that he does, he starts with a sketch. Nothing abnormal, right? That is what we usually do. But here is where it gets nice and fun and how we can take these tips from traditional art and put them into, tra into digital art. After the sketch, what do we do? We make a background, we make a wash because it is super important for any artist out there, if you have painted in traditional, you know this, to kill the white of the canvas. This is how many artists call it. The white of the canvas is a big enemy enemy for your colors and for your composition. So one of the best things that you can do is kill the white of the canvas. He does it by doing, doing some washes and I'm gonna show you very soon how you can do it in digital art. Next, he puts some local colors. For all the ones that follow me and have seen my shorts and all of my content, you know how much I care about local colors and we're gonna talk a little bit more about them. But for now, it is important to know that they are there. Next step, he does the shading. And you can see in here, he already started with the shading, but he has also some 
spots in here. By the way, the technique that he's using right here is wash. So he is at the start playing with transparency and making some um, transparent watercolor effect. And then he goes back and he rescues some of the whites with an opaque wash. And we're gonna do something super, super similar with digital. And finally, after all of his skeleton, all the, the, the base of the painting is done, he goes and he makes overpaints, all right? Don't forget about overpaints, they're super important. We're gonna talk about them in this demo today. All right, so that is the workflow of traditional media. Now, I want to show you guys how to take all of this thing and put it in digital art, all right? So let's go and make a the same example, but with digital art. I hope that you guys like this little posting here. So I have a friend that told me that I needed to draw a dwarf. <laughs> so I took it to myself to draw a dwarf one of these days. And what is the first step that I needed? A reference. This reference, I took it from Nathan Fox. For all of you that know James Gurney, probably you know Nathan Fox. And again, if you don't know him after this live, after this video, go and Google Nathan Fox, another master, another fabulous, fabulous, fabulous artist out there, incredible with landscapes, but also with portraits. So I was just scrolling through my Instagram. I saw this portrait of his and I thought like, damn, that is beautiful. I'm going to use it as a reference for one of my paintings. Now, it is not very good to uh, use the other other artists as reference, They're the work of other artists as reference, but if you change it enough, if you're experienced enough to be able to change it and stylize it, you can get away with it. So step number two after getting the, the reference is making a background, same as James Gurney, all right? Same as, as James Gurney, you want to kill the white of the canvas. And here I just took some brushes with some texture. I just played with some colors. This is super important because it's also gonna give you a base for your mood, a base for your colors. So now that we have this background, let's go and put the next step, which is of course the sketch. Now you can see, hopefully you can see the, the reference in here. Can you see it? A little bit inspired, right? I know, I know, it's pretty far out, but I wanted to do exactly that. Just inspire myself but not that people would see this and say like, ah, it's a copy of the work of Nathan Fox. Disclaimer here, right? Let's take a second to make a little parenthesis. Do this if you feel confident already with form, with drawing, with shading. If you're struggling just with rendering, don't do this. Dedicate some time to just study the reference as it is. All right, so with that, let's continue. Doing the sketch. What follows the sketch? local colors. I just went under the sketch and I painted again with some painterly brushes, uh, a little bit of the skin color, some with some color variation. You can see in here some red for the nose, for the cheeks. You can see a little bit of the saturated color under the eyes and just some playful colors all around, right? Nothing super polished. I didn't want this painting to be very, very digital looking. So I went with it. Next step, the shading. And in this case, I am using a workflow where I use a multiply layer. Now for all of you that ask me all the time, how do you do the shading? Do you use multiply? Do you clip the layer to the original base? Do you make a layer for each of the masks that you're creating? In this case, it's super simple. And I'm gonna show you in here. Very, very simple. If I have a layer, that has the local colors and I want a painterly style, I paint in this layer the eyes. Let me make the brush in here. The eyes, I make the skin, I make the hair and everything together in here, hair. And then I clip to this layer, another layer that is in multiply mode, multiply. And in here I paint the shadows. This is how I make this type of paintings that have a bit of a more of a painterly style. And especially when why I want to preserve the king here is I always use this one when I want to preserve the color variation. Okay, this is super important. When I want to preserve color variation, I always use a multiply layer. Otherwise, I might just create a regular layer on top. All right, so with that, let me just go in here 
And with that, let's go to the last one, which is the overpaints. This one, super, super important. Let's just go back and forth so you guys can see. Overpaints are super essential, very, very important that you take a moment to paint on normal mode on top of your painting because normally if you use these layer modes and all of this, your colors are going to get desaturated. They're going to be get yucky and you don't want that. So take a moment, create a layer on top of everything. You can also flatten all of your layers. I feel comfortable with that. I know that a lot of artists don't feel comfortable with flat flattening their layers, but dedicate some time to paint on top of it. You can see that I decided to change the color of the background and I added some scars in him. I added some little hairs. I wanted to keep it play, uh, playfully and uh, playful and, and a little bit traditional looking. So I went with all of this. All right, so you can see exactly the same steps in the process, reference, background, local colors, shading, and overpaints. Exactly the same process that you guys can have in traditional painting. So let's go and check how to add a little bit more texture into your art. A lot of you ask me, how do you, do you get a more traditional look in your art? So here is where we're going to see it. It's a very similar process, but I want you to see the different brushes that I used so that I create a little bit more of a traditional look, okay? So same steps. Step number one, you guys know it, is a reference. This is a singer, older verse something. I started listening to him. He was, um, I like his music and I like his beard. I think that he has a very unique face. So one of the days that I was just looking to paint something, I saw him as like, all right, this guy is fun to, to paint. So I started with what a background with a background that has a lot of different colors. I wanted this, and this is very important. When you create a new painting, the background is going to inform the mood of your illustration. So in this case, I wanted a warm background because I wanted kind of like a melancholy, nostalgic look that would go together with his painting, sorry, with his singing. So I created a warm background. You can see some grays in here to add variation, but in general, it is pretty warm some playful things with the, with the brushes, and that is it. Next, a little sketch. I went with my own interpretation. I didn't follow the, the reference quite directly because I didn't want to follow this pose. He looked a bit too serious. So I decided to, you know, give him a bit of an angle on the face, make, give him a different expression on his face, just to have some fun and keep it loose because I want this painting to be loose and painterly, all right? After the sketch, what follows? Some local colors. But a key here, and this is very important, can you notice that below the local colors, there is this layer of very saturated red magenta? Well, this is a little trick that you guys can use always in your paintings if you want to increase the saturation, the richness of your painting. I'm gonna just show you in here how to do that. I'm gonna bring my colorus so you guys can see it right here. And it's very simple. You're going to grab a saturated color. Once you have the sketch, you're going to grab a brush with enough texture. So for example, I am here, this nice little painting brush, maybe a little bit more desaturated, something like this. And you guys are going to create a first mask. No, don't make it opaque because it's gonna make it look super, super uh, digital. So use a little bit of the texture of the brush, okay? Use a brush that has a nice traditional texture fill it up and then on top of this you're going to create a new layer and start painting your actual colors but don't cover it completely you're going to paint in here let's say that this would be the skin of your character of your portrait go over it and make sure that you leave a little bit of the magenta coming through the colors before you finish your local colors and that is what i did in here you can see i cover the face i cover the hair and the shirt and all of that magenta is coming out of the colors and making my final painting, my final result much, much richer than it would be otherwise. So that is the step of the local colors. I hope that you guys are enjoying. If you have any questions, continue putting them on the chat. I am super happy to answer them um, soon when we are going to be doing the demo, all right? Next, shading. Now, notice something weird about this shading extra. This shading, just like the previous layer, I am making it much, much warmer than usual. And I'm also doing it in multiply mode. And I'm going very light with it because I don't want a very, very 3D painting in this case. And because it was very light, 
I went and I added another layer just for the darkest details. And I started with the overpaint, which fi finishes with this one. All right, so very quickly, reference, background sketch, local colors, shading one, shading two, and overpaint. And there you go. A more traditional look for all of you that are always asking me, how do you get a more painterly traditional look? I hope that you guys enjoy it. All right, awesome. Now, how about we have a look at my absolute favorite workflow. I know that you guys, the ones that have watching my content uh, for a long time know that that is my favorite workflow, is the one that I use to paint that little spidey right there. That is the reason why a lot of, of you guys know me. And it is, of course, <laughs> called masking. I know that you guys probably are very tired of me sharing and, and telling you that you, sh you must try the masking method, but I honestly think it's one of the best, all right? <laughs> I really think it's one of the best. And if you are looking to have a more stylized result, something more like that Spidey that I show you guys, or a lot of my more cartoony paintings, use masking. It's really, really good. All right. So what happens with masking? Kind of like the same idea, but we're going to have a bit more of a polished approach. We're going to make first a sketch over a background. In this case, I went directly with the background and we're going to make a sketch that looks stylized and um, sharp and nice and, and fun to paint with enough angles. This type of approach works excellent if you're working with something that has a lot of angles like these guys. Next, we're going to do the masking. That is why it's called masking, right? We're going to simply select each part of your object and we were going to paint it in a different layer. Now, a lot of people ask me about this. So we're going to have a closer look at how to do this and how to make clean masks very, very soon. But for now, I will just tell you what I usually tell you in the videos. You're going to select each part of your, object, of your illustration and paint it flat in a new layer. So in here, what is happening? The skin is in a layer. This little part right here of the earphones is a new layer, the green one, all of these things are in a new layer, each thing that is in a different color. Because this is going to make it so much easier for me to paint a very clean result with the next step, which is local colors and then the shading. Believe me, it takes a while to get to the masking, to get the masking done, but after that, the process just flies and you guys are going to have a fast, fast, fast render. All right, so that is masking. Oh, and we have missing one final step. Every time every time that I finish an, an illustration and I forget about this, I, uh, I always regret it. Make sure to add some post-production, all right? You can see the difference in here. Let me just zoom in so that you guys can see some of the little effects in here. Just take a little moment and think when you finish your painting, just make sure that you take a moment to bring it to the next level, treat it kind of like you just took a photo, you put it in Photoshop and you want to really like squeeze all the juice out of that photo. That is the post-production, all right? And we're going to talk about it very soon in the demo so you guys can see exactly how I do it. But for now, that is it with the masking. All right. And for all the people that ask me, but Lucas, isn't this too complicated? I see that Max Greke, I see that, um, Bastard Mary, I see that so many other artists out there are using another workflow and that is black and white to color. Isn't it easier to make it black and white and then go to color? Yes, yes it is. It is much easier. But the problem with this is that you can end up with very desaturated colors and you guys don't want that. So I'm gonna show you how to do it from black and white to color, the process, but Definitely, I don't recommend. If you want vibrant colors, try to avoid this until you are a bit more comfortable with layer modes and things like that. But in any case, I'm gonna show it to you. All right, so black and white to color. This is useful for a lot of you that want to practice first in black and white and then take those illustrations to color. Let's have a look. You're going to have first a sketch, of course. This is quote from the... Uh, King's Killers Chronicle, I think it is called, from Pat Patrick Ruthfuss. Uh, I love those books and this character is the protagonist, so fantastic books. Thumbs up if you know who this character is. We're gonna do the masks, just as per usual. But in this case, of course, black and white. 
and then we're going to do the shading. That is the beauty of this workflow. You don't, uh, you don't have to do a lot of color variation because we're going to go directly into the shading. Very easy to do it in black and white. Then we're going to colorize the object. And if you have any questions about it, we can talk about it or you, I have other videos that touch about how to colorize. You're going to colorize your painting. In this case, I colorized it and I added a little bit of these effects. Like for example, this light right here was added with overlay mode and these shines right here were added, I think with color dodge or add mode. And then we are going to add C, the overpaints. There you go. That is the difference between before and after with the overpaints and without the overpaints. They always help. So I really recommend that you guys put them. And finally, we are going to have the post-production and the post-production of this one is really juicy. So I'm gonna just show it here close up. I really like how this one looks with the post-production. It really helps to sell the, the mood of the character. So post-production always super important. Okay, so I hope that you guys have been uh, enjoying. If you have any questions, Again, make sure to put them there in the, um, in the chat. And if you're watching this in the replay, just put them there in the, in the comment section. I always go through them and I answer to all of, all of the comments that you guys put. And I can use those things to answer you guys in future videos, like in shorts and things like that. So make sure to put any questions that you have in there. And for all the, the ones that have been asking questions already, we're going to get to them in the demo part. All right? So. Let's go and talk about some important, important uh, FAQs, okay? When I told you guys that I was gonna do a render class, a lot of you sent me some questions. So I tried to put them covered as much as I could in here. But again, you know, if there are a lot of questions, so I cannot answer all of them. But let's start with one that is Lucas. Do you use textures? A lot of you know that a lot of artists use photo textures to make their art a little bit more maybe realistic. I am not one of those artists. I really don't like the effect of photos in my art because they look like 3D renders and I, I, like, I don't like that feeling. So the only textures that I use are paper textures. For all the ones that saw my latest, no, my first pack of brushes that I released uh, a couple of months ago, a few months ago, the halftone brushes, you can see these effects that I have in here in the shading. A lot of my, my, uh, a lot of the juice of these illustrations came because of the paper textures. You can see that in here, it has the effect of the paper texture on top and here is without. So those are the only textures that I use. Paper textures to add a little bit more of age and a little bit more of a traditional, um, traditional look to your illustrations. All right. Next question. Uh, how do you get nice edges when masking? All right. So this is for all of you that tell me that you have problems with the lasso tool or that you don't know how to get nice, clean edges, sharp edges with your masking. I'm going to show you exactly how I do my masking. So let me just share in here how I do. There you go. So you can see Photoshop. Uh, surprise, surprise, we were using Photoshop for the, for the whole presentation. <laughs> of course, you knew. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do those, those edges. All right. So first of all, I use this brush right here, which is not in my store right now. I used to have it on my first pack of brushes. I'm going to release it very soon with my new, um, with my painting pack. Uh, it's the first time that I mention it, but I'm going to release soon, hopefully, a painting pack. I'm working on it. But this one is the LP Creamy Solid. This is a very default brush. You guys can use it by simply going and creating it in Photoshop. It's a, it's a normal round brush with transparency. That's all it is. But this is the most perfect brush that I can find for making masks. A lot of artists come and make their masks like this. They select the lasso tool and they try to make the masks with this thing. It gives good results and everything is fine. But what I don't like about this is that it gives very, very sharp angles and it doesn't allow me any room for mistakes. What I prefer to do is use the brush because then I can make it very small and I can make the nice shape that I want. And you can see that I can control it much better. You see here, I didn't get, get uh, quite the turn that I wanted. So instead of having to redo the selection with the lasso tool, I can come in close and just fill it up 
with the brush itself because I can just make it bigger and get exactly the type of turn that I wanted. All right, you can see? Now, what I do in here, let me just show you the layers in here. And I do this very fast. You can see this is the layer that I used. This is the brush that I used. What I do is I press Command J. I'm in Photoshop, so I just Command J and duplicate it a couple of times and then Command D e, and I fuse it. Why do I do that? Because sometimes I paint little details or I, when I'm painting it, I leave paint, uh, parts that are semi-transparent like this and they are going to be a pain in the butt to fill up. But when I duplicate it, Command J, Command J, Command J, you can see how it becomes more and more solid. So then I just fuse them and then I select the interior, <laughs> grow the selection and fill it up. I have everything stuck to my key, my, my keyboard shortcuts because this is something that I do very often. So if you guys have any questions about those, um, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna be talking about it, okay? So that is how I do my nice edges for masking and I hope that it is very useful to all of you. Now let's go back to the presentation and I can show you the next FAQ. So now this one is very popular. My colors look dead or dirty. Ah, the amount of times that I was, that I had that problem when I was starting out, that was my biggest problem. Of Out, out of all the fundamentals, composition, anatomy, color, values, construction, my colors, <laughs> my colors were always, always killing me. They were the worst colors. They made everything look dirty, brown, it was horrible. So I'm gonna show you why they looked horrible and flat. And I'm gonna do it here live with you guys. So let me just bring in here Colorus so you can see what I'm doing. By the way, Colorus is a little plugin that Photoshop has. You have to buy it. If you want it, um, I really like it. It helps me select my colors a little bit better. Not sponsored by, by Colorus, but I really recommend that tool. All right, so let's do a bad example, okay? Let's do a bad example together. We have, a, what is this, a greenish blue ball in here? Random color, but it doesn't matter. If this affects any type of color that you guys want to work with. Mistake number one that I see art is doing. You see this a color selector in here. Instead of selecting a saturated color, you guys go to black. Black or gray. I am locking the transparency on the layer. I'm selecting an airbrush and you guys do this. Ugh, maybe not you guys because you guys are here on the live stream, but some other not, <laughs> not very uh, attentive artists. Ah, look at that, it looks horrible. I feel I feel dirty just by painting with black. I'm gonna select this color again and I'm gonna just remove a bit of the shadow because it was way too much. Look at that horrible shadow, black, ugh. Okay, and then let's make it even worse. I select the color and instead of painting with a, you know, a nice saturated color or anything or changing the hue or nothing, I just make it, again, I select it and I just make it a little bit lighter or even worse, I, get, I go to white, god damn it. I, okay, I really hope that you guys are not doing this. Uh, <laughs> and if you are doing it with black and white, this is just, like I hope that this is the wake up moment that you need it to stop doing it, okay? I put the white in there and dear heaven, that is disgusting, okay? If you guys are painting like this, please, okay? Stop it. <laughs> please stop it. This is absolutely horrible. Now. Let's go back and make a nice example. Let's select this and start painting how, <laughs> how it should be painted. We select the color and always, 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 always move the hue. There is not a single thing that you guys are going to paint ever, ever in, in this world at least that he has an atmosphere where you're going to not move the hue. Move the hue towards the color of the environment, all right? you're going to move it in this case towards blue because here is the paper around us. Here's the paper that is blue. So you want to have this color and move it towards the color of the environment. You're going to also want to saturate it and go down in value. 
Now I exaggerated this a little bit, so I'm gonna just take it a little bit back to the green. And there we go. I'm gonna log the transparency and I'm gonna go with the color of the environment. Now look how much richer that shadow looks in comparison with what we were painting before. I'm just gonna make it a little bit darker. Right there, select the color back again to remove it. And there we go. Okay, much better. Now, we're going to make the highlight of this ball. We're going to select this color and instead of just going to white, we're going to roll in the opposite direction. That means to a warmer yellow, warmer green yellow, and we're going to put it up there. Now that looks so much nicer, so much nicer. And don't forget that colors, almost any material out there gets a saturated rim between the shadow and the and the light. And there we go. Now we have a playful color that shows the light of the environment much, much better than this horrible, flat, dead thing. All right? You can, of course, can increase the contrast because this one below has much more contrast. So you can just come in here and make it a little bit darker. And you can, of course, make this one a little bit lighter if you want to increase the contrast so that it matches the one from below. But this is the way for you to make your colors not dead, all right? This is super important. Everything clear there? I hope that you guys got it. It is super important this. If I would have known this years ago when I was struggling with my colors, this would have changed everything, everything, all right? So let's continue and let's see something that a lot of people are struggling with, how to paint metals. Painting metals is something super, super fun if you know how to do it, and it is not that complex. So let me show you how to do it. Here we have some cylinders. These are made of con out of concrete. I just Googled for an image. Concrete, I looked for it because it has a very flat, matte texture. It means that it doesn't have speculars, which it means it's very easy to start painting like this. And here on the other side, we have metal. And you can see some of the difference. Of course, one of the first things that you're going to notice is that it has a reflection, right, of the other elements in the environment because they are isolated on a white environment. You don't have a lot, a lot of reflections, but you can also see that it has highlights, of course, and it has um, more concentrated shadows. Instead of dispersed around the whole border of the cylinder, the shadows are kind of like compressed, kind of thinner and higher contrast. So let's grab here a couple of masks, by the way, this is how I do my masks. And let's paint it. I don't know what type of metal this could be, but let's say that it is something like, like a warm copper, all right? or bronze or something like that, right? It doesn't really matter, it's just some type of yellow metal. Let's start by painting this as a um, regular object, okay? So we're going to make a shadow on one of the sides. You can see I am saturating the colors and moving it, rolling the hue. Right here, and we can have a little highlight on this side. because maybe the source of light is coming from this side. This part, we're going to have it a nice little gradient from left to right, because the light is on the left side. And maybe now we can increase the, the shadow just a tiny bit, and that will leave us with a nice little bounce light on this other side, okay? So something like that, super simple. If you want to also add a little rim, something that I like to do, let me just show you the layers very quickly. Here in the layers, here's the top of the cylinder. I just duplicate it, come in here, move it a couple of pixels down and fill it up with a color that is light. And there you go, you have a nice little rim. It is important to have these little rims because it makes your objects look a little bit more uh, natural, okay? So now let's go back to the regular view so you can see it. There you go, you can see the whole Photoshop in here. So there you go, very simple to do as a 3D, 3D object with a matte surface. I'm just gonna 
maybe add a bit of shine on this side of this object so you can see it completely. All right, that is, uh, that is a more normal uh, concrete type of object, right? It doesn't have any texture, nothing, but it is quite there. Now, let's go and turn this into a metal. So I have in here, I'm gonna s uh, make a little group for the concrete one. Let's name it concrete. And let's make this one a new group and we call it metal. All right, so what is going to happen with a metal? The first thing that is going to happen is that the uh, contrast increases. So we're going to press Command L to bring up the levels. You can use this thing also in Procreate. It doesn't matter whatever app you're using. It usually has an effect like this one, curves or levels or whatever you want. And you're going to compress in here the blacks and compress the whites. You're going to compress them until we get something that is a little bit more high contrast than the regular material. When you do this, you're, go you're going to get also more saturated colors, but we don't want that. So what I'm gonna do is now press Command U and desaturate this object a little bit because it's way too saturated. All right, now let's do the same with this one. Increase the contrast in here and decrease the saturation. All right, so let's see how we're doing. Okay, the concrete and the metal. Can you see how it starts to look a little bit more like metal just by increasing the contrast? It is that easy. But of course, we're not just going to leave it like that. We're going to make a new layer, pin it in here, and we are going to increase the contrast even more. I'm going to go in here and put a nice dark reflection and I'm gonna go in here and put a nice light specular highlight. We can even go almost to white white. And something that metal usually has is something called Fresnel effect. It sounds super fancy, but all, all that means is you're going to have a little bit of the environment light affecting one side of the object and the other side of the object. Just a little bit of Fresnel effect Fresnel, <laughs> and we're going to be almost there, looking looking pretty metallic, right? And how about we come in here and we add a tiny bit of reflection from the environment. Let's say that there is an object on top of this thing. We're going to add a couple of lines and look at that. Didn't we just get a nice shiny metal, huh? <laughs> Pretty easy to do, right? If you do it step by step, it doesn't have to be that complex. And you can get pretty nice uh, results pretty fast, actually. Let's make this one white, white. This little rim. Right here. Can you see it? I'm gonna get co up close. This little rim between. We're gonna paint it white and there you go. Of course, we can keep noodling this thing until it gets a little bit more refined, but I think that this that we got in here is quite enough. So that's how we go from a matte object to a metallic object. And you can, of course, just tint it whatever color you want, and it's gonna give you different types of metals, but it is really that easy. So awesome, that is metal. Uh, and let's go to skin. How to render skin tones. This is something that also a lot of you uh, are always wondering how to paint skin tones. So let me give you a hand so that you don't have problems painting them anymore. Now for all, the, all of you that want to have a little bit more details on how to paint skin, I have a very, very in-depth video on my YouTube channel. You can just go in, in there in my uh, posted videos and just put how to how to paint skin and you're going to find a full full presentation explanation as in-depth as this one but just about skin okay but in case that you don't want to go through the whole thing you are going to receive just the most the two most important tips that that whole presentation has about how to paint skin and those are doesn't matter how much you change the skin tone. Look at all of the skin tones that I have in here, all of these little heads. I painted from references, 
of uh, different photos in different light environments. But guess what? Doesn't matter how, may, how much you change them, all of them are going to have the same two rules, two very important rules. Let's have a look at them. Number one, always use a C curve. Skin, just like any other material, increases in saturation when you go into the shadows. Almost any material does this, but subsurface scattering materials, SSS materials, for all of you that don't know what SSS is, is a property of certain materials that reflect refract the light inside of them. Again, if you want more details, go to the full video that I have in my channel. But almost any material out there, except like concrete and things like that, get much more saturated in the shadows. And skin is especially more saturated. So what you want to do when you're painting skin is you want to start with your middle tone somewhere around here. Then you're going to progress into the shadows and you're going to paint the shadows very, very saturated, the middle tone in here. And then the deepest, deepest shadows, you're going to desaturate them again. Believe me, this is going to work every single time. It doesn't matter which skin tone, skin tone you're using. Okay. And the tip number two, is that you are always, always, always gonna roll towards red. That means doesn't matter what your skin tone is, doesn't matter where you started, you're always going to walk towards red, okay? That is because we have layers in our skin that are going to refract the light that hits our skin, therefore, they're going to come a little, a little bit more red than what they started with. So. There you go, those are my two tips on how to paint skin. I hope that they help. And just like I told you at the start of the presentation, there is just so much more that I want to show with show you guys. Some of you ask me how to paint hair, okay? I know that that is a, a very big challenge for a lot of you. Uh, I want to show you how to paint this style of illustrations, which is a different pipeline than, than the other ones, a different workflow. The cell shading uh, style that a lot of people now recognize as a Valorant style. Uh, I want to show you how to change the mood or light of your illustrations. Doesn't matter what type of light scenario you want, you can add whatever light. You can see in here, I added a light from below. All I want to show you how to do that. I want to show you how to add special effects. This is a painting that I did very recently, again, testing these new brushes that I'm making, how to add these nice colorful uh, effects in your shadows without breaking the color palette and without breaking your values and so many more things. Okay. If you want more of these things, make sure to comment in the replay of this video. Once it's on YouTube as a recording, comment the word more. And I will know that you guys are watching it first, uh, that you're watching it on a replay. And second, that you want to, of course, go through all of this, uh, all of this content. All right. So it is demo time. <laughs> I hope that you guys are enjoying the presentation. Now we are going to start with the demo and uh, I'm super excited. This is uh, the latest painting that I just finished, this one that I just put in here. I finished this painting in like one of my fastest paintings. So I want to show you exactly how I did it. We're gonna go through the process. I'm gonna show you how I did the shading in here so that you can replicate it in your artwork and hopefully accelerate your render time and accelerate your results so that they look nice and polished. And you can use this for more, more painterly uh, techniques and for more cartoony techniques. It doesn't matter what it is. These tips are going to serve for you. All right. So let's go and jump into the demo. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk about the demo. And I'm, I haven't forgotten about the questions that you have been collecting throughout the, the live stream. I'm going to be answering those questions uh, very, very soon. All right. Um, if you uh, want to just continue putting them there on the on the on the chat, and I'm going to take care of them. All right. So live demo, let's talk about how I made this illustration. Number one thing that you guys need to do is collect references. Doesn't matter 
what I do always, I always start by collecting references. This illustration happened or this illustration started um, by me just going into Pinterest and Google some faces and started simply doodling them. You can see in here the doodles that I made. I started by copying some of the references that I saw in Pinterest. I did nothing else than just doodle them. I put them in there, I started copying the faces until I started loosening my hand and getting some inspiration. At, after some point, I started drawing this reference right here and I thought like, huh, look at that. Wouldn't it be funny if, the, if I paint this girl kind of like biting a pencil? That would be a fun idea for a rendering tutorial, right? And put it on one angle, put it in another angle, put it in this angle and I thought like, hmm, what would she look like if I would remove the pencil? What type of expression would she have? And the one that I came up with was this one. I like the shape design, I like the expression of the girl, so I refined it a little bit more and that became the sketch of my painting. Here is the final result, right? Nothing very loose, you don't have to make things super, super loose. You just need to have enough in there that you understand it as a three-dimensional object, all right? Now, let's, the next step that I did in here was do the masking. So let's go and show you exactly how I went and created the masking for this object. I'm gonna share the whole Photoshop so you can see it. And see me create the layers. So here in this layer right here, I have the sketch. In this layer right here, I have the background. Very important to have a background so that you know the mood of your illustration. And here I have a blank layer. So the first thing that I did in here as I, is I went, selected this brush that I shared with you guys before, open my colorus, put it right here. And with a random color, doesn't matter what it is, I started making a mask. Now masking can be a very, uh, time consuming process and it doesn't have to be the, it's not the most interesting, but it's gonna really pay off. So you can see in here, I am zooming into the illustration because I want my hand to create smooth lines. And then I go through the borders and I make a single shape, okay? So here I am collecting this. I close the circle because I know that on top of this, the hair is going to go. So once I have this, I add the ear for this because I have a tip right here for the ear. I want to make the brush a little bit smaller. And that is why I love doing this with the, with the brush instead of the last tool because I can just come in here and erase those mistakes. And of course I rotate the canvas so that it always fits with the direction of that is easier for me to create the lines. So you see in here, I created this double line. I'm just gonna paint over it. And there you go. That is as simple as that. That is the first mask because it is the skin that is gonna be on top. I'm gonna duplicate this layer a couple of times, pressing Command J, Command J, Command J, Command E, Command E, so that I can fuse these layers. And then with the wand tool, I'm just gonna select, select, and then I'm gonna grow the selection. Now, this is, if I just fill the selection right here, you're going to see that it's gonna leave me these pixel lines right there. This is not a problem that, this is a problem that only Photoshop and I think that Affinity Pro and maybe, yeah, that's it, are going to face. Procreate users, Clip Studio users are not going to have this problem because your selection tool and your fill tool are much better. But here in Photoshop, you have to do one extra step. And that is, I go into select, and I think in here, modify, and I click expand. Now I have this into a shortcut because otherwise it would be very time consuming to do this, but I just expand the selection and it's gonna give me a little window that tells me how, for how much do you want to expand this selection? And I usually tell it by around five pixels. And there you go. Now it's selected inside the lines. And now, I have another little shortcut that is attached here into my pencil that I'm just gonna go and press it and it's gonna fill it up. This, by the way, is the command uh, Alt Backspace in the case that you are working in a computer. Alt Backspace does this, but again, to save myself time, it is attached here to the pencil. Boom, ready to go, right? 
this is one of the masks. Now after that, I would create, for example, the mask for the hair. And the mask for the hair was very interesting because I wanted to keep it nice and flowy, but I also knew that I wanted to have different layers for the hair. So I created one mask on the back, right here. You can see I can connect these masks and if I don't like something, I can come and erase it. Here I don't like the, the ending, I also can just come in and erase it. Duplicate the mask, fuse the mask, select. Oh, of course, don't forget about connecting the mask right here. I put it below the face. Grow the selection by five pixels, fill it up. You see, it is not that slow once you get used to it. And on top of the head, I decided to go with other little layers like this. Simple stuff, one layer in there, create another one. Everything I have attached to shortcuts because it saves me time. So here is one more, grow the selection. And you can see how this is done very, very fast. All right. Of course, you know, I'm doing them quite fast in here, but otherwise, if this would be for a final illustration, I would be erasing these little details so that I make sure that I have the sharpest masks that I can, but super easy to do. And even if you want to modify the shape after the fact, that is something that I for sure did in this illustration, you can select any of these guys and transform them. Play with the warp tool and suddenly you get a different shape of our hair. If you want to not have to make all of the masks by hand, you can grab one of these ones, duplicate it, and just bring it over to this other side. Bring it in here, put it a different color, and use the same mask to cover a different part of your hair. So you can see how this workflow can be very, very effective, very, very fast if you get used to the method of making masks. All right? So those masks are going to be here in all my layers. You can name them, that would be super good. But if you don't name them, that is fine. Once we have all the masks, the drawing is going to look something like this. All right? The colors don't matter. Doesn't matter what you did it's going to be fine because now we are going to add the real colors. So we are going to go back in here to the masking and what I do is I select all of my masks and I block the transparency. Any software out there can lock the transparency. Let me just zoom in so you guys can see what I do in here. Any software out there has a button like in Photoshop, you have this button right here that blocks the transparency. I'm gonna press it and then very quickly, I go through every single one of these ones I'm going to show you again Photoshop and add the right color. So in this case, you know, I select the skin, select the right color for the skin and add it with one click. Again, I have it. The button is right here on my pencil. Select the hair, go to the color that I want for the hair and add it. This one, same thing. This one, same thing. And this one, same thing. And there you go. Simple as that, you can start adding all of the colors that you need. And once you need something else called color variation is going to be very, very easy to add. This is how it looks with the final base colors, but it is very, very important that before you start doing the shading, you add a little bit of color variation. So I'm going to show you how to go from this to this one right here. Super easy once you have the masks, you're going to just come in here, select. In this case, I have to do it because uh, with the magic wand because all the layers are flat, but otherwise you can use the mask that you already created and you're going to fill it up with a little bit of color. Skin is super important that you make it with a bit of color variation. So you're going to put a bit of red in the center of the face a bit of yellow on the top of the face 
and a little bit of a more desaturated magenta in the bottom of the face. You do the same thing with the hair. So in this case, you can select the whole hair. And what I did is I added kind of like a, like if she would have painted hair, I added a bit of violet on the top of the hair to add color variation. This color variation is gonna make your drawings, uh, your paintings much more interesting once you start with the shading. Actually, you can see how just by adding those couple of layers, it starts looking like something, right? It even starts looking like a little bit of shading. But anyway, once you have all of this, you're going to have the color variation. And here is where we are going to go into the rendering. But before going, we go into the rendering and we go into the next step that is gonna look like this one right here, I'm gonna do this one with you guys. It's gonna take a little bit longer. So before that, let me just take a sip of water and answer some of your questions that you have been asking throughout the live stream, all right? So. All right, and we are back. Thank you very very much for waiting, guys. I need a sip of water because this is uh, hard on the throat to, to go through all of these things. So let me just quickly in here, I got the questions for you from you guys. So let me just open and I'm looking for your questions. There they are. All right, so let's just, before we do the, the rendering, let's go and have a look at the, at your questions, all right? So let's cover a few of these guys. Will this class be available later for rewatch? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, let me just put them in here together. Uh, Abdul, absolutely, this class is going to be available for everyone in the, uh, in my YouTube channel later as soon as actually as soon as this class the live finishes is going to be live for everyone that wants to watch it and rewatch all of the details in here so this yes um i have a gaumon s620 pen tablet drawing on it gets tiring quickly and my hands ache oof any tips I actually don't know the model S620, but this is the one that I am working with. Let me see if I can show you in my webcam. This is the uh, the one that I'm using. Oh no, I cannot show you. But this is the Cintiq that I'm using. It's 24 inches, which means that right in front of me is kind of like this size, you know? Let me put it in here. It's kind of like this size in front of me. So it really helps the size for you to move your whole arm instead of move your just your wrist. So what I would recommend you, that works for me personally, I know it's a very expensive thing and it's very easy to just say like, get yourself a bigger tablet, but it can actually really help with your hand pain. If you don't want to invest, of course, in a very big tablet, um, which by the way, I recommend, if you're gonna get a tablet, get yourself uh, the Huion, because it's much cheaper than the Cintiq. I just got the Cintiq because, you know, this is my job and I have been doing it for like over a decade. So it just made sense for me to get Wacom because I was used to the brand. But if you don't want to spend all of that money in a, in a Cintiq, get yourself the 
the Huion, I really recommend. Uh, or yeah, XP pen displays can be cheaper, like again, Sahu said. Uh, you can try them. I have had a better luck with Huion than with, X with XP pen and Gaoman and, and all the rest, personally. All right, next question. Uh, can I get a quick definition of what values are? Yeah, absolutely. Nikki, values is just how you make your painting with black and white. So if I have in here, you know, a little, <laughs> this is a cube. <laughs> Let me paint you a cube. Uh, if this is a cube, you're going to want to um, study first just with values because it is going to be much, much easier than if you try to paint everything with uh, with colors. Sorry, the microphone is right here. Uh, so try to learn first just your values. It's gonna make your life much easier if you make things just with black and white than if you make it full color. So that is it, that is values. How to make things in black and white. Put a little bit of light up here, a little bit of reflected light on this other side and how about a little bit of a rim light right here? It always helps. Da, da, da. Awesome. So there you go. <laughs> that is values. Awesome. Um, perfect. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Harrow. I know how to draw in 3D and I want to take the next step with values and color. How can I study values? Any tips or exercises? Absolutely. I recommend, first of all, that you watch my videos. <laughs> I cover I cover with values in a lot of them, so I'm gonna continue posting tips all the time. But if you need to practice a little bit more, um, some good practices that I can offer is get yourself a sphere, a cone, a uh, cube, get yourself a couple of basic figures, put them on a little environment, put a light next to them, and take a few photos, or even better, instead of the photos, paint them live. Make studies with values until they look nice and 3D, just with values. Once you feel confident with values, that's when you know that you're gonna be absolutely ready to do these guys in color, okay? So paint these guys, progress slowly to plain things, okay? To things like this one. Don't go to uh, smooth shading. It is very important if you're doing values that you go from planes, let me put it in here for everybody to see. Go from this to planes to smooth and then you go to color, okay? color. All right. Planes. What I mean with planes is not smooth things, just angles. They're very important for artists. All right. What is uh, an overpaint says again, Sahu overpaint is once you have your painting done, let's say that, and I'm going to show you my layers in here, uh, or actually hold Photoshop so you can see it. All right, there you go. So, uh, oops, this guy, I made it a little bit too big. There you go. Okay, so let's say that we have a new layer. I created a new layer and I have in here my base color. I have in here my eyes. Let's say that we, we are following the masking. And here I have my hair. <laughs> in a new layer. All right, this is my hair. And I start, you know, by adding a little bit of shading to all of these guys, by locking the transparency, and I start adding some shading. Right here, under the hair, around the eyes. <laughs> it's a horrible example, but I hope that it helps to illustrate the point. And here we have the hair. <laughs> all right, there you go. You make a nice, beautiful painting. And once you finish with all of these things, uh, you grab all of your layers and you either can leave them as they are or duplicate them. So 
Sorry, guys. Um, and once you have all of these guys, you fuse them and you can start doing the overpaints, which means you create new layers on top of this and you paint directly on top to create all the effects that you want. So for example, in here, you paint the hair on top, you paint the eyes that you were missing, all of these little details, those are overpaints. You finish your painting basically. All right, so that is it with, uh, with a few of the questions. We're gonna go back to these ones a little bit later, but for now, let's go back into the demo, all right? So we're going to show you, we are going to uh, make this thing together, all right? I know that this is the most challenging part. Every one of you I know can do the masking. I know that all of you can do a nice 3D drawing, but going from here, into a three-dimensional painting. This is the biggest jump and I want you guys to see exactly how to do it. So let's open in here the render demo and here you can see all the layers that made this painting, okay? Just for you to have an idea, this is why I usually, when I make my paintings with masking um, method, I do them here in Photoshop because you have a lot of layers that you have to manage and you know that Procreate gets a little bit overwhelmed if you put a lot of layers. So here I have each of these guys separate. Now, let's go and start painting. Something super important, have some reference around you, all right? So in this case, since I already painted this girl just recently, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna have a reference in here, but for all of you, make sure to have some reference, you know, a portrait reference, something that you are, uh, that you want your painting to look like later. And once you have that, let's start. So let's start with the most complex thing, the face. Because the face has color variation, instead of painting directly on top, which is a possibility, I could just lock the opacity of this layer and start painting with an airbrush right here, right? Painting all the shadows. Instead of doing that, because this will kill all my color variation, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm gonna clip it to the face. And this one I'm gonna put in multiply mode. Here, I'm going to select a middle shadow color and I'm gonna start putting the shadows. Now you can start doing these shadows whatever way you want. It is important that you're familiar with the planes, planes of the face. But in my case, I usually like to start with big shapes. Something like this. Big shades for all the shadows, right here. And for the nose right there. Okay, you can start pretty rough and very quickly get a sense of how your painting is gonna look. Here I'm assuming that the hair is projecting a shadow and also on this side. If you didn't select the right color, don't even worry about it because that is the beauty of this workflow. Everything is separate. So you can just simply go back to this layer <clears throat> and change the color. I log the opacity and now I'm changing the color to find something that suits me. Very quick, right? I'm gonna come here to the line art and lower the opacity just a tiny bit more and continue rendering. Something that I like to do when I'm doing this type of rendering style and I have a multiply layer is that I like to create a new layer in here <clears throat> and just put the color that I'm using for the shadows on the side because sometimes I need to reference it again. Um, I see that somebody's asking about the brushes. These brushes that I'm using right now, these are the painting brushes and they are nowhere right now. But I am actually working on them. That is why I'm making so many demos because I am trying them out, making sure they're nice and working for me to share it with all of you, the painting brushes. But this one, this specific brush that I'm using right now, is a very easy brush to use. You can see that it is just an ellipse of my default airbrush. So if you are familiar with any type of airbrush, 
This one right here is just an ellipse. It helps me to render very, very easily. It's my favorite render, my favorite brush for rendering when I'm making things smooth. And yes, the live will be available. Live will be available after this finishes for you guys to come back. It's gonna be right there in the channel for all of you to come and check it out if you need some more info. Here, right here under the tongue, let's put a little bit of shadow. And the nose, I feel like it has a strange shape, so let me just clean it a little bit. All right. How about a little bit of a shadow under the eyes? Right here and then a bit of an airbrush. <laughs> Thank you very much, Oxid. Li very happy that you like, uh, you like the work. And that is the beauty of this workflow because I have this layer separate. You can see it here in the lower right corner. I can erase the shadow just where I need it to, just where I don't need it, to bring my lights back up. Aha, uh -huh. how is it blending so nicely despite everything being 100%? That is because I am using a very light pressure on the brush so that it doesn't create very hard uh, edges. Let's try a bit of a darker color. I feel like the shadows are a bit too subtle. So maybe something like this. Like that would be better, maybe. And I think I went too deep with this shadow, so let me just erase it back. All right. Now, this is a good beginning. We can do the same thing with the hair, but guess what? The hair has just very little color variation. So instead of doing a multiply layer, I can just go directly into the same layer, not have to create a new one, select the color and do the same thing that I told you guys about how to clue, how to select the right color. I'm going to go saturate it and I'm gonna roll the color towards the blues because the environment is blue, all right? How does the color on the layer change in real time when you're selecting it on the wheel? Aha, uh -huh. that is uh, because I have here on my pen a shortcut that tells Photoshop fill the current layer with the color that I'm selecting. So for example, if I'm selecting this layer and I come in here quickly, I select a different color, I right at the moment when I select the color, I press the command or come here, press, come here, press, you see? So this one super useful, it is attached to Alt Backspace, that is the command that Photoshop has by default. So anyway, I can come in here and do it directly into this piece of, of, of hair where I can just create a little bit of, sh of shape simply by going with the flow. Here, because it is very organic, it doesn't matter if you make some mistakes, it's going to be completely fine. So let's put a bit of a shadow here. Let's do the same thing with this one, a bit of a shadow. And this one right here, also a little bit of a shadow. Maybe a bit more saturated. Saturated. And here, let's again put a little bit of shadow right there. Shadow right here. And I really hope that you guys can see the power of this workflow because it is extremely, extremely fast. Once you have your masks done, this, it, this is done so fast. Here, I can create a suggestion of a little hair also right there and with another a bit harder brush I can create the shadow of this hair that is on top. Simple, simple. It's just playing. At this point if you understand that you are painting basically what is a cone it's just painting. It's just having fun with the shapes. This is also, by the way, a great workflow if you are looking to um, 
work in a in a pipeline in a studio pipeline because everything is divided that means you're not making uh you're not destroying your workflow every time that you are working on it but everybody that wants to work on this after you worked on it can come back and check out the layers I'm a CSP user, says Zerita. Does the brush matter or does any airbrush work? Depending on the airbrush, uh, I use a default airbrush, but you can see that it gives very soft results. So I don't use it unless I'm making a very soft gradient. If you want to have a little bit more detail, I use this one that has an ellipse shape and that way it can give me actually very sharp results. If I make it small enough, you can see that I can make almost completely hard results, right? But if I use it soft, just with a little bit of opacity, it can give me a gradient. So that is why I love this specific airbrush right here. So yeah, it matters a little bit. And of course, if I want to create a harder edge in the hair, I can come in here and make a nice little edge right there. And again, because hair is so organic, you can simply have a little bit of fun with it and there is no way that you're gonna have it wrong, all right? That is the beauty of it. Can you use the default brushes on Clip Studio Paint to add the shadows, highlights, and details? I think that maybe you can, um, depending on how the default brushes in Clip Studio Paint look like. I actually don't use the default brushes. All of the brushes that I use are the ones that I create myself, so I'm not super aware of how they, how they look, the default ones. Okay, something like this. Um, is this the default brush? No, all of them are brushes that I have created in the past. Question, I have downloaded Adobe on my PC, but is there a way I could connect it to my tablet so I can use my pen or is it a mouse uh, only? No, of course, you can connect it to your tablet. I'm working on a Cintiq, on a Wacom Cintiq right now, and you can connect any brand of tablet that you want so that you can have uh, pin pressure. Otherwise, it would be impossible. How about we come in here? You can see that, you know, it is taking a little bit of shape, but I am missing some hard, darker shadows between these hairs. So I'm going to come in here and add some occlusion right where these hairs touch each other. That is better. It creates more of a 3D feeling. Right here. Can you for sharing? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Morija. Thank you very much for connecting. Um, can you suggest some default brush for beginners to paint basic shadows? Yeah, absolutely. Just try it with the ones that the software has by default because you're not going to need much. You're going to actually be using mostly a hard round brush and that one is in every single software out there. And if not, then I think I really, really hope that I can release this set of brushes in the next maybe 30 days i really hope let's see let's see in any case just check out my socials and i will keep you updated whenever i release this painting pack which of course is going to come with a bunch of um, demos and tutorials exactly on how to use it all right so starting to look nice let's go and paint a little bit of the of the body of this girl everything is simply creating basic shapes. So I'm just gonna, because again, you can see that the body of this girl has a color variation. I need to create a new layer on top and put it in multiply mode again for it to work. I'm going to select the same color that I had before. I think this one was the shadow color. Uh, no, it looks like I changed it a little bit for a more red one, something like this. And I'm gonna create a gradient. So below the neck, there's going to be a gradient. And right here is going to be another gradient. But of course, because of volumes, <laughs> you're going to have a bit of light on one side and a little bit of light on the other side. For all of you interested on how to paint specific anatomical details. <laughs> and of course, we're going to have also a light uh, right here. Easy peasy. All right.
And if you want, you can always use as much tool. And this is one that I think I have for free on my website. If you go to lucaspinador.com, there is a little free pack of brushes that you can get. And this smudge brush comes in there and it is available for Procreate and for Photoshop. You can get it in there. All right. Awesome. Looking nice. Starting to look a little bit more 3D. Let's put a shadow right under the necklace. Right here. Right there. I'm always changing to the brush that works better for whatever purpose I'm, I'm uh, selecting. All right, looking nice, but it is not quite where I want it. So let's go and add the deeper shadows. For that, I'm going to use the same layers that I created. So I have in here the multiply layer and in here the other multiply layer. So the, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go a little bit darker and a little bit more red, and I'm gonna use this same multiply layer to add a second layer of darker shadows. Easy, easy, easy. Doesn't take any time. And you can start creating quite a nice sense of volume, of contrast, that is gonna really take your illustrations to the next level. Make them look 3D. Very nice. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna take all of your questions. I see them coming. I um, really, really appreciate that you guys are connected. Even if it's 3 a.m., that is awesome. Thank you very much for being here, Jack. Um, is it the same in Procreate? The same, the same thing here in Procreate. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Rick, thank you very much for being here, man. Uh, you're always welcome. Um, thank you very much, man, for... for coming in here. Um, thanks for the studio workflow. That is awesome. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely, people. Super happy that this is helping. Uh, again, if you're watching this on the replay, leave me that uh, comment in there. Tell me, just comment the word more and it's gonna really help for me to know that you guys are, first of all, finding value in this demo, in this whole class, but also that you guys want more, more rendering that you guys like this topic and want to learn a bit more about it. Okay, let's put a bit of a shadow here, shadow there. Let's put a bit of a nose definition. Nostril on one side, nostril on the other side. Pretty easy, right? Of course it is easy because I already made this illustration. So then I'm just repeating what I did before. <laughs> this is, uh, it is always easy the, easier the second time. Believe me, when I was making it before, it was not quite as, as, as fast. It went fast, I did the whole thing in three hours, but still not as fast as now. All right, so there you go, guys. This is the, the process of the rendering. This is what I do with every single one of my illustrations when I want to make them three-dimensional if I really want to have this style. Looking very nice, right? Compared with how we had it before, let's just go back and forth. It is looking quite, quite three-dimensional, right? I hope that you guys are enjoying this one. Awesome, awesome. Greetings from Madagascar. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you very much for being here. Um, how about we go and we check some of the, some of the questions? that you guys sent before, all right? Let's see where we were before. Uh, what type of layer, type of layer? Um, I'm not sorry, Franco, I'm sorry, Franco, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but I use multiply layer for my shadows, overlay usually for my shines and add saturation, and that is about it. Uh, any tips on creating lights and mood for a scene? Yes, absolutely, it is a very, very nice tip that uh, you can go and check a video. I have in my YouTube channel a video on how I do these things, how I add mood into my illustrations. Uh, it is called How to Color Like a Pro and you can watch it on my channel, all right? Um, 
What brush do you use to do the masking? This one I already showed you guys is this LP Creamy Solid. I have a question. I have so many ideas and I have a hard time sitting down and drawing something on my screen tablet. That is a question from Tasia. Uh, how do you plan and create what to draw and there are uh, when there are so many ideas? That is awesome that you have so many ideas, Ta Tasia. That is great. I actually have the problem of sometimes not having enough ideas. So that is great that you have them. What I usually do is I just sketch them very quickly like I showed you in here. Let me just go back. So I usually put the references on one side, on one screen, and then I start just doodling. And that is my process for every illustration. I doodle, 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 and then I find something that I like, and I just go with it. I don't think about it too much. I just try to make something nice because most of my paintings are actually uh, to teach you guys. So that is the way that I personally do it. How do you know where to stop with post-production? Because I have a hard time knowing where to stop and then it looks too detailed. Absolutely, Laura. I'm going to, at the end of this demo, I'm going to show you how I do the post-production so that you can know when, when to stop or at least when I stop, all right? How to do shading? How to smudge or shade two tones or two colors in Photoshop? I find it hard to do with different brushes. Do I have to use the default round brush? No, you don't have to use the default round brush, Himani. Uh, thank you for the question, by the way. And how to do the shading is exactly how, I'm, how I am doing it in here, how I'm showing you that I'm doing it in here. I know that you sent this before I started with a demo, but also, remember please that this is just the first part and right now the results are very soft, which is not something very good for any painting. So at some point, what I would do is I would fuse these two layers. You see in here, this is the multiply one and I would just fuse it. And then I would start with some direct painting. And with this, I would create some hard edges. Like for example, right here, I would bring a little bit of light and make sure that I have a hard edge where I want it because hard edges are super, super important for any painting. If you don't have hard edges, your painting is going to look super fake, super digital. You don't want that, okay? So make sure that you get some of those nice hard edges. And for that, where to put them, you can either use a reference, for sure you can use a reference, or you can have, um, just study the planes of the face, okay? So then I would do that. Or of course, if you want a more painterly style, I would use a brush like this paint texture and I would start going at it with a more painterly brush, you see? In here, for example, going with the flow of the skin, with the direction of the shading. And wherever I wouldn't want these hard transitions, I would use the smudge brush. With this is called the LP Smudge Creamy to soften that texture, right? But I'm not going for that uh, texture look. So let me just go back so that I can have the, the soft one. All right. So that is how to uh, shade in here. Do you mask the whole area first and then split into small masks? No, I mask every single thing, one in here, and then I, if I have something small, I make the mask inside and the mask inside. Every single one separate. John Pepper, do you always use more saturation for the environments or does it change based on the color temperature? More saturation for the shadows, I mean. It's almost, almost always, almost always when I paint an object, I select first a color that is a bit more pastel and then for the shadows, I it's 99% of the cases, I saturate it more in the shadows. And then for the highlights, I desaturate it. That is how I use most, how I make most of my colors. All right, so there you go, John Pepper. Uh, thank you again. Uh, for all the questions, let's see if I have enough time to answer all of you guys. All right, so how are we doing? I hope that you guys are enjoying it and uh, learning how to do the shading. Um, let's see how we're doing. We're going to go back 
and let's see, before and after. I would say that is quite a nice result for such a fast demo. So how about we go into the finish shading, all right? Here we have the finish shading version. And of course you can see the difference. I'm not using it as a reference. So I was going with a different style instead of having this very hard bridge in the nose that I was going for. It looks like on the painting, on the other painting, I was doing more of a soft bridge of the nose, something more like this. So let's go and check it out again. And of course I added some other details. I made the eyelashes a bit darker. And of course I shaded things like the teeth and uh, these little details in here. But you can see that everything, you know, it might look like a lot of things once you see everything as a group, but it is not that much. You just take each one of the objects and shade it exactly the way that I just showed you. And you're gonna end up with something that looks exactly like this. Now, speculars, <laughs> this is a little bit of cheating, all right? This is a little bit of cheating. Here we have a little bit of specular. I couldn't hold myself adding that specular, but honestly, I recommend that all of you leave your specular shines for a later stage in the process. Otherwise, they're going to kind of mess up with your painting. But here, I couldn't hold myself. So now that we have here the finished shading, what I want to show you is how to paint the material difference in this paintings. So I'm just going to show you where I usually go and I put my speculars. So I'm going to select something like this one. And I'm going to start putting a little bit of specular here and maybe use a color that is a bit colder like this one right here. Let's see. Use this one as an eraser, put it right there put it right here. How about on the nose? Maybe a little spot here, maybe a little line, right? Something like this. Then how about on the tongue? We can create something like a shine right there. And of course on the metal, we already saw how to paint metals. So you know that metals are simply objects with a little bit more of reflectivity. So I'm just going to put a little shine there. Also here, we can put a bit of a shine. Maybe on the lip. Ah, that is very nice already. Shines are something that really helps to bring your painting to the last, last little level, but you have to use them sparingly. If you put them everywhere, they're going to make your painting not look special. Okay. So let's just make sure that you use them carefully. Here, because I want this to be kind of like a sticker that she has on her forehead. Maybe we can make it shiny also. There you go. Nice stuff. And how about this necklace right here? It's made out of some type of metal. So let's make it shiny with very, very simple effect. I'm just gonna go in here in the border. And put a bit of shine right here also. Right here. And every time that a surface is looking towards the light, this is the key for all of you that are wondering how to do reflections Whenever you have an object, let me take this water ball right here. So in here, you can see it has a bit of reflectivity. Well, it actually has reflectivity everywhere, but you can see that the specular right here in the metal is always pointing to the source of light. So that is what we want. We want to find the places in the face of our character or in the hands, wherever we're painting that would reflect directly the direction of the light. So those places usually are corners. Or in the case of these nice cones, there are a little line in here that goes in the back and it becomes thinner on the tip. Something like this. All right. And here, usually it would happen in the corner, right on the corner that is looking towards us. 
Same on this one. Same here. Oh, thank you very much. I forgot to share with you guys. There you go. So I just painted for the ones that, for uh, those little strokes that I didn't uh, show you guys. I painted this in here. I painted the light on the cones. And I painted these nice reflections right there. You can also put one in here if you would want. And then we can go into the hair and do the same thing. Depending on the type of hair that you want to paint, you're going to have a more reflective or less reflective hair. So you can start adding nice reflections like these ones, if you would want. Look, the way, the way that I do it is I put a stroke first and then I go over it with the eraser to give it a more um, a more traditional or more of a hairy look, I guess. More brushy, more bristly. You see, something like that. That's what I do with the hair to make it feel nice and shiny. I put it and then I erase it a little bit. So there you go. You can see how much just a little bit of highlights really helps to bring your portrait or whatever you're doing to a whole different level, all right? There we have with the final materials. You can see that I also added right here, this always helps a bit of bounce light. So I took the idea for all the ones of you that uh, asked me about bounce light, when light comes down here, ta -ta 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 -ta, and hits the skin, it absorbs the color of the skin. So it turns skin color. And then when, when it bounces back, it has the color of the skin. So the places that are in shadow around that part are going to be colored with the color of the skin. And the same, th the same thing happens all over the place. You can see that also the skin got a little bit more purple because the same thing happens. Light bounces on the hair, absorbs the color of the hair, and then bounces on the skin. This beautiful um, bounce colors or bounce light really, really helps to make your illustrations come to the next level. So there you go, a little bit of materials. And then the post, there you go, this is the post. I hope that you guys like it. Let me just show you this one a little bit closer because I'm really happy with how the post-production of this one came out. Again, here's from before and after, and before and after. Really nice stuff. I didn't want to add too much, but I think I still added a little bit too much. There are um, several effects and I want to just quickly show you a couple of them so that you know how to add post-production to your illustrations. Very quickly, so that you guys know. For me to add the post-production, what I did is, first I decided to add this light of, of cyan and magenta on one side and the other, so that was very easy. I just created a new layer, I put it in overlay mode and then I started painting the light on one side, right here, and on the other. Right here a little bit, right here, and right here. And I did the same thing with a magenta light. I painted on this other side with the overlay layer. And this layer, of course, was clipped to the portrait. I painted a little bit of magenta. Something like that. Easy stuff, right? After that, I created a new layer, again in overlay mode, but what I did is I painted with an airbrush this time the same effect. So I created a bit of a luminescent effect right here around the places where the magenta was hitting it right here and on this side and you can see how much it helps right 
it really makes the, the painting something different. That is what I like. It kind of like adds that final touch. Then I went in here with a nice texture brush, again from the pack. So let me just show you everything here. Here from the future painting pack, I have this one in here that is called LP Dust. For now, you know, name is work in progress. And I added a bit of a dusty effect. You see? A little bit of that. And a little bit of that. I added some freckles. So I came in here with a splatter brush. I put this thing in multiply mode. And I added some tiny freckles. In here and in here. And I put these ones brown and in lower opacity. Something small like that. And once I had all of that painting exactly how I want it, I fused it in one single layer and I added a filter um, sharpen, smart sharpen with these settings right here. Amount 335, 37 and 1.2 radius and that helped to make the painting just a little bit sharper. Let me show you how it was before. So this is before and this is after. I don't know if you guys can see it throughout the video but everything gets a little bit more defined. And finally I had a little bit of noise. So filter, noise, add noise. And there you go. That is how I took the painting from this one right here to this one right here. And of course, a little bit of color balance, but that is all. There you go, guys. That is how I made this painting. And um, thank you very much for being here. If you have any more questions, you can throw them in the chat right now. I am going to open here the questions and try to answer as many as I can before we finish. So we are going to finish very, very soon. If you have any questions that I haven't answered, throw them in there, all right? Uh, Alice, you always forget about the post-production. Yeah, that is not good. It's always, it always adds a tiny little bit. Uh, Ellen Nielsen, it is going to be recorded, yes. Um, portfolio reviews, Lucas Catoira. I think that maybe in the future, yeah. Throw them in my in my DMs and I might do a piece of content about it, okay? Uh, glad, glad, thank you very much, Atomic, Yurdiong, thank you for this, this is very comprehensive, super happy to hear that. Um, super, super happy to hear that. Taz, Tazneem, uh, please save this in the channel, it is going to be there. Uh, Jesse, yes, you can uh, watch it later. Um, Atomic, you answered everything I was hoping for. That is fantastic. Um, is there good, I'm gonna answer here, Rolling Dutch, is there good refs and bad refs? If there are, how you can tell. Bad references have bad quality, bad quality, bad uh, lighting, bad lighting, and they are they are awkward. Try to find photographers, good photographers, and try to study their photos. Uh, if you just go randomly to Pinterest, you might find some very softly lit references. So whenever you're trying to find a reference, look for ones that have, first of all, a nice one directional source of light, okay? If you don't have defined shadows, you might find yourself with a bad reference. So look for this type of shadows, 45 degree shadows that are nice and defined. Uh, if you have something that looks, this is good. And if you find, have something that looks a little bit more like this, let me put it in here. This is not so good to study, all right? So look for harsh shadows, whenever you can, instead of soft shadows. That is a good tip for, for working with shadows. Um, 
<laughs> yes, Yamada, post-production is super important. Can you achieve the sharpen and noise effects in Procreate? I think it does have a noise and a sharpen effect. So yeah, I think you can do both. Um, thank you so much for the tutorial. Super happy to hear that. How long has it been since you started to do these kind of paintings? This specific uh, masking style of paintings, uh, effort, I started six years ago when I got a job in a studio, but I have been painting, of course, my whole life. Is the only way to choose good colors learning color theory? No, not at all. Go out and paint from real life. That is the best way for you to learn how to paint with beautiful colors. Go out and paint from real life, not from photos, from real life. Uh, Yuneki, for anyone who missed uh, to come late, yes, it will be recorded. Um, Aha, uh -huh. Alois, if you search for reference just for the pose, you do have to imagine the shadow. That is why I recommend if you're struggling with things, with references, do not uh, invent, okay? Do not, this is a brain. <laughs> if you're starting, do not invent. I want you to see. See, do not invent until you get used to things. My first life and worth it. Thank you very much, Ernest. Super happy to hear that. Thank you so much, Jack says for the demo and a bit out of topic question. What motivates you to create this demo tutorial and helping us, your viewers? It had been quite a long while without me doing a live and I felt like I was disconnected from you guys. So I really wanted to take some time to actually see what you guys wanted to learn and, and communicate with you. Uh, Drea, is Procreate a good app to use? I'm having trouble when it comes to coloring rendering. Procreate is fantastic. If you have uh, an iPad, it is the best tool you can use for the iPad. Alice, thank you very much. Super happy that you enjoyed it. And Tasnim, how to get the color you want when you mix colors? Um, when you mix colors, you can get fuzzy things happening in digital. So if I just mix these two right here, it is not going to give me a nice transition in between. Usually most colors have a more saturated transition in between them. So, well, in this case, it's actually a good transition because I use a very, very saturated color. So let me just try it again. Here in, and maybe something like this. Okay. So when you have a color happening uh, like this and you mix them, you're not going to have a nice transition. Instead of that, you want to create a nice saturated rim in between these two, okay? So you can see that it goes from here to here. I am trying to see here in the color selector where it, go where it goes. You want to select the color in the middle, saturate it, and make a nice rim in the middle, okay? In the middle of the light and shadow, you want to have saturation right there, all right? Super happy that it was useful. And in here, um, two minutes more for the last questions. Let's see, let's see. We answered this one. I don't get what local colors are. Local colors are the local uh, colors of the objects. So for example, skin has many local colors, red, yellow, green happening all over the place. But you have also um, normal objects. Like for example, this hat that I'm wearing is simply one single local color, which is black. That is the local color of the object. But when light, shines on the object, you can you can have many different uh, effects happening, okay? But the local color is what is the natural color. When you see a photo, uh, what color is the object that you're seeing? Uh, you can do all of this thing in Affinity for sure, yes. How do you choose colors for an illustration like this? I just choose them from my head. I don't usually uh, work with palettes. That is why you use the, you see that I use so much purple because I am a big fan of purple. Do you shadow always with a soft brush? No, I don't usually, uh, or not always you do it with a soft brush. If I want a more painterly effect, I use brushes like these ones right here that have a tiny bit more texture. These are some of my favorite uh, brushes from the, from the upcoming pack that have a bit more of a painterly look. Is the multiply layer always on top? Absolutely, if you want to shade something with multiply, always on top. I'm a CSP user. Does the brush matter or does any airbrush work? Yes, the brush matter, <laughs> it matters and not every airbrush works the same. How do you choose the shadow color depending on the local skin color? The shadow color on skin is usually more red, 
but also depends on the color of the environment. So if it is this skin in this environment is not gonna get this red in this environment. It's gonna get a little bit more desaturated than what I painted. If I start drawing to low pixel, can I change the resolution after? Yes, you can change the resolution whenever you want, but it is better if you start already from a high resolution. Ooh. And there you go, guys. Do you believe line art affects how you render? Like a sketchy pencil outline opposed to thick markers? Um, yes, your sketch does matter, but it doesn't matter the same style, the, the, the specific style that you use. What matters the most is that you have a 3D uh, sketch. That is the thing that matters. And there you go, guys. <laughs> I tried to answer everything that I could before the two hour mark because this is our signal to stop. Thank you very much, all of you that joined. If you have any more questions, leave them on the messages in the comments on this video once it is uploaded. Um, in any case, thank you very much for connecting. Uh, I hope that this was super useful. And again, if you want more pieces of content like this one about rendering, just comment uh, more in the, in the comments of this live once it's recorded, once it li it's uh, up uh, updated on my YouTube channel. And thank you, all right? So thank you very much. Uh, throw me some fires there in the chat and, and, and nothing. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you in the next one, all right? Bye-bye.